To start off our look at electrolysis, let's go back and take a look at the electrolysis of a molten salt. And for my example, let, let's go back and consider sodium chloride. The first thing we need to do is heat the sodium chloride to break the ionic bonds that exist so we can have mobile ions, a necessary requirement for electrolysis. So here I have liquid and liquid sodium ions and liquid chloride ions present as my electrolyte. I then have two inert electrodes, perhaps made out of carbon, and then these are connected to the terminals of a battery, and in this case this will be my negative terminal and over here the positive terminal of my battery. Now, I'm now going to determine to which electrode these ions will move. So let's take a look. A positive side will pull electrons up in this direction. They'll travel through the battery, then be repelled by this terminal and sent down this way. So over at this particular electrode, sodium ions will gain electrons. And at this one, the chloride ions will drop off their electrons. So let's write those particular reactions out. Over at this side, where we have the gaining of electrodes, electrons, uh, that's always defined as the cathode. So the cathode will have sodium ions gaining electrons and turning into sodium metal. Now, I'm going to write down the E associated with that reaction here, uh, negative 2.71 volts. Over at my anode, the chlorine ions are dropping off electrons and turning into chlorine gas. And the energy associated with that from our standard redox table negative 1.36 volts. Summing up these two, I get an energy value, and I just want to point out here that it's a negative value. Now we truly can't use these values because our solutions aren't one mole per liter. We're dealing with a molten salt, and we certainly aren't at 298 Kelvin, but I want to emphasize here we have a negative value. Electrolysis is not a spontaneous process. Sodium ions and chlorine ions do not spontaneously turn into sodium and chlorine gas. There, my overall reaction. This process I used of determining the species that were present and then to which electrode they will migrate is something I'm going to use in my subsequent look at the electrolysis of aqueous solutions. So let's now consider the electrolysis of an dilute solution of sodium chloride. So things will change slightly in our mixture. We'll have sodium ions present, but now they're aqueous, as are our chloride ions, but we also have water present. We connect it up to the terminals of our battery, same as before, the negative terminal on this side, positive here, so my electrons move this way, and then down on this side. Sodium ions, again, will move over to here, where they'll gain electrons, so this is my cathode. Chlorine ions will drop off electrons on this side, so this would be my anode. But those aren't the only species that will, could migrate in this case. If I take a look up here at the redox table, I can see here, right here in this reaction, water can gain electrons as well. So I now have two possible candidates for reactions occurring at my cathode. And likewise, in the table, right down here, I can have water molecules going in the reverse direction and dropping off electrons here. So water has the capability of either going to the cathode or the anode. So let's take a look at these potentials here. So I've written the two of them down here. So these are the reactions that could take place at my cathode, and here are the reactions then that could take place at my anode.
Now, to determine which reaction actually occurs, I'm going to consult this information. When determining what is selectively happening at each electrode, we must consider the E values of the species involved. So let's look at these two values for a moment. The first thing I notice, this is a very large negative value, indicating it's not as likely to happen as this. The more spontaneous value is the one that's more positive. So this reaction is more likely to occur. It will be selectively discharged. At my anode, I'll apply the same rule. I have two values here. The one that's more positive is more likely to be the reaction that takes place. So these water is more likely to undergo oxidation and reduction in this case than my sodium and my chlorine. If I determine the overall reaction in this case, I'm going to need to double this reaction to ensure the number of electrons lost and gained match each other. So in this case, if I sum up what's present on the reactant side, I'll have three water molecules. Those will produce two OH ions. They'll also produce a hydrogen. They'll produce two hydrogen ions and half an oxygen. And if I take those two values and add those together to get the energy required for the reaction, I get negative 2.41 volts. Again, a negative value telling me that it's not spontaneous. Now a little tidying up of my overall equation, the two OHs and the two H plus, these species, can produce two water molecules which can now be reduced with what's on this side. So essentially I have the electrolysis of water. Water is being broken down into hydrogen and oxygen gas in a dilute sodium chloride solution. I don't produce any sodium or any chlorine in this situation. Things can change, however, if I change some of the concentrations involved. So let's take a look at what happens now if I use a concentrated sodium chloride solution. So again, I have the similar situation with my negative terminal here, electrons moving down to this side, sodium ions and water molecules, both having the potential to gain those electrons. And then over on this side, the positive terminal with electrons being drawn up from the electrode, chlorine can drop off those electrons and likewise, so can water. Now, again, let's start with our cathode. Generally speaking, we choose the more positive one. And even though I have an increase in concentration of sodium ions, the discrepancy between these two values is so large that this reaction will still be predominantly the reaction that takes place because of its relative ease compared to the difficulty of this reaction with a negative 2.7 volts. At the anode, though, I have a situation where the voltages are much closer to each other. And in addition, I have a very high concentration of chlorine ions because I'm using a brine solution. So the chlorine ion concentration would be extremely high. That can compensate for the slight difference that we have in the values of their um, half cell reactions. So in this case, with a concentrated solution, this reaction would be favored. If I sum up my overall reactions, in this case then, I have H2O plus Cl minus producing hydroxide ions, half a hydrogen, and half a cl uh, chlorine gas. And the energy associated with this reaction, negative 2.54 volts. So by the choice of uh, changing the concentrations, I can slightly alter my reaction. Now, a little bit about the voltage here. To ensure if this is the reaction that I would want, I would perhaps use a concept called overvoltage. So I might operate my cell at, say, a much higher voltage than that which is required, 
which in this case is 2.5 volts. So I might actually choose to say something like 4 volts, um, which will ensure then that I'll produce chlorine gas as opposed to oxygen gas. In our next program, we'll take a look at how the electrode material itself can affect the nature of what goes on in electrolysis. Thanks for watching.